This video is all about the secretion and control and regulation of female reproductive hormones during the female reproductive cycle. Now, before we get into all the hormones, we need to define what the reproductive cycle is really all about. So we're going to look at a typical average human reproductive cycle, as if there is a typical average human reproductive cycle. We're going to assume that we're dealing with a 28-day cycle. Of course, that doesn't mean that everyone has a 28-day cycle. But it's a convenient number to work with uh, for our purposes. So day zero would be the first day of, of menstrual flow. Uh, day 28 would be the last day of the reproductive cycle, which would be the day zero of the next cycle. Now, if we look at right in the middle, day 14, we're going to assume that ovulation occurs on or around day 14. Again, highly variable, but for our purposes, we're just going to pick that day. Now, that divides up our cycle into two halves. We have the pre-ovulatory phase, which would be called the follicular phase, before ovulation has occurred. And during the follicular phase, we would have in the ovary a structure called the follicle actively secreting hormones. After ovulation, that follicle becomes a structure called the corpus luteum. So after day 14 and up to day 28, we have a functional corpus luteum secreting other hormones. Now, to get the details of the, what the follicle is, what the corpus luteum is, I'll, I'll reference you to the video on the human ovary uh, that I posted earlier, and it goes through how the follicle becomes the corpus luteum and what's going on with the ovary during the, the 28 day cycle. But we're going to look specifically at the hormones secreted by the follicle and the corpus luteum today. So we're going to start this by looking at the hypothalamus. That's where we start all discussions of hormones. Hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus is going to get the whole reproductive cycle started right at the very beginning of the cycle, day zero to day two or three. And it's going to do so by secreting a gonadotropin-releasing hormone, or GNRH. Now, again, we need to put a, a time frame on this. So we're going to assume this is around day zero to about day three, where the levels of GNRH are going to start increasing. The hypothalamus is going to start screening. Function of GNRH, well, its target, unlike the, the name, it sounds like gonadotropin must seek out the gonads. No, it's seeking out the anterior pituitary, and it's going to cause the anterior pituitary to release the gonadotropin hormones. So its target is the anterior pituitary just like it is for males. And there's a video all about male reproductive hormones. Boy, I've got to spell pituitary correctly. So let's start that again. That one's a little better. Okay, so the anterior pituitary gland is the target of GNRH. And what the anterior pituitary gland is going to do is secrete gonadotropin, gonadotropic hormones. Now, in a male, the gonadotropic hormones would be secreted simultaneously. That would be FSH and LH. In a human female, that's not the case. We're going to start by secreting FSH. And FSH levels will begin to increase shortly after and kind of overlapping with the GNRH. So we'd be talking about, in this time frame, oh, probably days 3 to about day, oh, say, around 12. That's when there's an active follicle present in the ovary, and that active follicle uh, is going to be influenced by FSH. So the target of FSH is the follicle of the ovary. So we're going to write ovary here. But there are two structures in the ovary that we need to be concerned with. The two structures of the ovary are going to be, in the first half of the cycle, the follicle. So that's all I'm going to write now, because that's all we're looking at at this point. And the follicle is going to produce the hormone estrogen. And this will also be in the same time frame. We'll start a little bit later, but say all around days, maybe five by the time the FSH is kicked in, to about day, oh, about 13 right before ovulation is going to occur. 
Now, the function of estrogen is it's going to stimulate the uterus. Now, the purpose of stimulating the uterus is to build up an endometrium, which will be a nice, healthy place for a uh, fertilized ovum to implant uh, if the ovum is, in fact, fertilized. So, estrogen will stimulate that uterus and start building that endometrium. Uh, estrogen, however, will also feed back to the anterior pituitary. And here's where it has kind of an interesting effect, because we talk about hormones having a negative feedback effect, and certainly estrogen does have a negative feedback effect. It has a negative effect on FSH. In other words, it's going to cause a decrease in the concentration of FSH. So as the estrogen level increases, the FSH level is going to go back down probably before day 12 that I've indicated here, maybe a little bit earlier, maybe, maybe day 8 or 10, the FSH levels are going to, be, going to be starting to be suppressed by the high levels of estrogen in that time frame of day 5 to 13. So it has a negative effect on FSH, but it has a positive feedback effect on LH. So the level of luteinizing hormone coming from the anterior pituitary is going to increase. And it doesn't increase gradually, it increases rapidly. So if you were to see this on a graph, it would look like a spike. It would be called the LH spike. The LH levels, luteinizing hormone levels, are going to rapidly increase. Now that rapid increase in LH is going to trigger the follicle rupture, and that's going to cause ovulation. So this LH spike is going to occur on or around day 14. Again, we're talking about average days. Maybe I should label this day 14, so we don't confuse that with the level of the hormone. So on or around day 14, we expect this LH spike. So the LH spike is going to physically cause the follicle to rupture, and it's going to become a structure now called the corpus luteum. The corpus luteum is now going to begin secreting the hormones, well, a combination of hormones. The one we'll notice first is the level of progesterone will dramatically rise. But there will also be an increase in estrogen because the, the corpus luteum is capable of secreting estrogen as well. Now, all of this is going to be happening from day 14, and it's going to have varying levels increasing and decreasing up to around day 28. The progesterone and estrogen are going to stimulate the uterus. The estrogen will continue to develop that endometrium, keep it as a nice, healthy place for an ovum to implant. And the progesterone is going to suppress contractions of the uterus so that the uterus doesn't contract and push that fertilized ovum out of the uterus, assuming the woman has gotten pregnant. Now, the progesterone and estrogen are also going to feed back. And they are going to feed back to the anterior pituitary and the hypothalamus, and this will be a true negative feedback mechanism. And that negative feedback will have a negative effect on GnRH, keeping that level down. It will have a negative feedback on LH, and as we saw before, estrogen has a negative feedback effect on FSH. So the levels of GnRH are going to be lower, the levels of FSH are going to be lower, and the levels of LH are going to be lower. And when all three of those hormones are low, well, then there's no more, no longer a hormone stimulating the corpus luteum or the follicle. Follicles long ago rupture. But there's no longer a hormone stimulating the corpus luteum, which means the corpus luteum disintegrates. And when the corpus luteum disintegrates, well, that means the estrogen and progesterone levels go down. And when the estrogen and progesterone levels go down, that means there's no longer anything maintaining the endometrium in the uterus, so the endometrium is shed. And that begins the next part of our cycle. Day 28 of one cycle starts day zero of the next cycle, and we go back to the beginning. The reason we go back to the beginning, back here again, is that low levels of progesterone and estrogen no longer cause the negative feedback. Without the negative feedback, the levels of GnRH are going to increase, which is then going to cause FSH to increase, which is then going to cause LH to increase. And we start the cycle all over again. Now, all of this cycle functions perfectly fine in this manner as long as the ovum is not fertilized. If the ovum is not fertilized, well, then we have a, a different situation. The negative feedback of progesterone and estrogen um, continues on during the pregnancy. And that's the subject for another video. So let's take a look at some exam questions to see how 
exams treat this topic. So here we have a question where the, the reading says researchers discovered that the phase of the menstrual cycle when breast cancer surgery is performed is related to the outcome of the surgery. When a breast cancer surgery is performed during a woman's luteal phase, the hormone that has the highest concentration causes the tissue surrounding the tumor to compress, making it easier to remove the tumor. So they're telling us that during the luteal phase, it's easier to remove the tumor. So the days of the woman's cycle when breast cancer surgeries would be most successful. So probably when it's easiest to remove the tumor. If the first day of the menstrual cycle begins with the flow phase, our day is blank. So really what this question is asking us is when is the luteal phase? And the luteal phase is when we have a functioning corpus luteum. And a functioning corpus luteum is going to be after ovulation. So day 14 is when ovulation occurs, so we're looking for after ovulation. So answer D would be after ovulation. Now, it's a follow-up question here, question number 39. The hormone that most likely contributes to the success of breast cancer tumor removal is, well, that would be the hormone that would have its highest concentration in days 15 to 28. So we know that LH and FSH are being acted upon by negative feedback during the luteal phase. And we know that the levels of estrogen and progesterone are increasing. But there is one hormone that is present only during days 15 to 28. If, it, if the answer were estrogen, well, then we'd expect that uh, the surgery would work equally well in the follicular phase as in the luteal phase, because estrogen has high levels during, as a result of the follicle producing estrogen, but it also has high levels as a result of the corpus luteum. But the only one that is present uh, only during the luteal phase is progesterone. There is no progesterone, or very low levels of progesterone anyway, during the, the follicular phase. So during the luteal phase, that's when you get progesterone. That's on days 15 to 28. So that would be the hormone that would have um, influence the, the success of the breast cancer surgery. Question 